This is Brandon Ward, student here at Penn State Lehigh Valley. I'm here with Emery Grafrovich, and it's November 16th, 2015, and we are at Penn State Lehigh Valley, Center Valley, Pennsylvania. So, Guff, can you tell me when and where you were born? I was born uh, in Nanticoke, Pennsylvania, 1947, a uh, little coal mining town in northeast Pennsylvania. Uh, who are your parents, and what were their occupations? Uh, my father's name is Emery, like, although it's spelled differently. He got a little nervous going into the service during World War II. He spells it E-M-E-R-Y. Oh, really? He was in the service as well? Yes. Well, uh, what branch was he in? He was in the Army. Uh, how many years did he do? Was he a lifeguard? Uh, or... Actually, he was in for what they refer to World War II as the duration. He was uh, drafted in, or he enlisted in 1941. The war started in 42, and he was discharged when the war ended okay. in, in 45. So. Wow. Uh, when he left the Army, he worked in the coal mines, uh, as many of the uh, men did at that time. Uh, my mom worked in a series of factories, uh, shoe factories, cigar mills, and things of that nature. So they were, you know, hardworking people. Uh, uh, my father eventually left the mines when the industry went downhill and worked in a series of factory jobs and so forth and ended up retiring in the early 70s with black lung which was a disease uh, related to his coal mining He's days. Coal mine. Did you have any siblings at all? Uh, I do. I have three sisters okay. and uh, a brother. Uh, and what I, are their names? Uh, my oldest sister's name is Diane. The middle is Marianne, uh, then Teresa, and then Paul. Paul was actually born two weeks before I got out of the service. There's 22 years difference between us. Wow. Uh, yeah. Were any of them in the military at all? No. No, just my dad and I, okay. and his dad. So my dad, my father, uh, and my grandfather. Could you tell us a little bit about their occupations? Uh, Diane is with the Postal Service. Uh, Mary Ann is a nurse. She's out in the Phoenix, uh, Arizona area. Uh, Teresa works for Wilkes University uh, with the pharmacy department. She's a staff assistant. And uh, my brother Paul is... Uh, He's like a business associate with a various companies taking care of their business aspects and so forth. Seems like a pretty accomplished family there. Yeah. yeah. So uh, what branch of the military did you serve in? I served in the, the Army. Okay. Okay. Uh, initially, I was drafted. Um, I was drafted in early 66, uh, but when uh, we reported uh, for our day to be uh, taken down to Fort Jackson, South Carolina, the draft was canceled. Uh, because spinal meningitis had broken out down there and they didn't want any new troops in. So I went back to the factory I was working in and uh, didn't want to do that anymore. So I finally found a recruiter. I said, uh, you know, I'm going to get drafted. When can I get out of here? And he said, he, an available date was uh, the Wednesday after Easter of that year in April. And I said, fine. So I ended up serving three years, although I actually have a draft number. Uh, which begins with a 52 rather than a 12. Okay. So, so uh, you left for boot camp uh, in that April of uh -huh. 1966. 66. Okay. Can you, uh, can you tell us about your time there? How many weeks did you spend? I spent uh, nine weeks down in Fort Benning, Georgia. Okay. okay. Uh, it's actually uh, the jump school for the United States Army. They have a jump school down there also for airborne. Okay. Okay. Uh, but I spent uh, nine weeks there. And the one good thing about high school, I never figured I was going in to college or anything, what have you, but uh, I did very well in math courses. Mm -hmm. And that really saved me, Ren, in, uh, in, a, in a sense, as far as an op occupation in the Army. Uh, I was then sent from Fort Benning after basic training to Fort Gordon, Georgia, where they had aviation electronics training. And I trained on repairing autopilots on fixed wing aircraft. So I spent, Oh, geez, from June till like November okay. of 66 there, and then I was transferred to uh, Fort Hood, Texas, uh, where actually they couldn't use my job, my Why is MOS. That? Uh, they really had no fixed wing aircraft there or anything. They, they were okay. just trying to get people out of Fort Gordon. And they then were forming three Mohawk units, uh, surveillance units, up in Fort Lewis, Washington. And I was assigned to one of those units that eventually went over to Vietnam. So you definitely traveled to a lot of different locations in oh, such yes. a short period of time. Yeah. Um, Georgia, Texas, 
Washington. Yeah, I saw it. a lot of parts of the country, yeah. Right, other than those three states, uh, and then obviously going to Vietnam, were you lo stationed anywhere else in, in your time? Uh, after I returned from Vietnam, I was stationed at Hunter Army Airfield in Savannah, Georgia. Okay. So, uh, from Fort Lewis, uh, I, I then was transferred, well, we, our whole unit uh, flew to Vietnam uh, in October of 67. Oh. oh, backtracking a little bit, going sure. back to boot camp. Uh, what were some of the things that you enjoyed about boot camp, some of your dislikes? I'm not sure you enjoy any part of boot camp. <laughs> uh, I, I will tell you, it was a great growing experience for me. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, I, I was born and raised in a small coal mining town in Northeast PA. And uh, the barracks that I was in was a real odd combination there were about half of it were, were guys from Pennsylvania, not necessarily just the Northeast PA, but the Reading area and some in the Philadelphia area and so forth, and a group of guys from Ohio. And to be very honest with you, this is the first time I really had a chance to interact with people of different races and creeds and, and colors and, and things of that nature. And so basic training really started a growing experience for me so that I began to understand that, you know, this is, this is, in, you really get to learn to live with people. Right, exactly. And uh, that helped me quite a bit right. in my future. And it's, it's pretty interesting, especially today, since, you know, you had Pennsylvania and Ohio residents in your barracks, and now it, it just stretches across the entire country. You could have somebody from Florida, California, <coughs> Maine. It, it doesn't matter what. It doesn't you know, matter, right. What part of the state. Right. So other than that, uh, some of the other things that you uh, enjoyed? You know, it's just uh, basic training basically uh, tries to, at, at least in my opinion, break you down as an individual and build you back up as a team. Yep. And that, to me, that was their whole focus, that, you know, you have to work as a team in the military and so forth, and everything was structured that way. Uh, I'll be very honest with you, I was a, kind of a picky eater. <laughs> After, be, picky there. after basic training in the military, I, I would try probably anything now. <laughs> so, yeah. so how did you adapt to the military life, like the physical regiment that they have you go through, uh, the barracks, you obviously just said the food, and then the social life yeah. in itself? I think I enjoyed the military. I'm, I'm a structured kind of person. I, I like things to be, if you will, regimented. I, I, I need to know where things are and so forth, and I like that about the military. Uh, I always try to take that with me, you know, through my career afterwards and so forth. Uh, you know, the physical end of it, I played some sports in high school and so forth, so I was in pretty good shape, although I had worked in a factory for two years before I was drafted or, or entered the military. And uh, so I was still in pretty good shape, and uh, you end up, uh, you know, playing all kind of, you know, basketball and so forth on your free time when you have some free time in basic. And uh, so I, I think I adapted well, both uh, the physical part, uh, the mental part, uh, the social part of, of working with folks uh, uh, throughout. So, Having served with Army individuals myself, I know that their physical fitness assessments also go in, you know, with their test scores in determining whether or not they go up in rank or not. Was this the same during the Vietnam War? Uh, probably a little different. Uh, at one time, I, to quote some numbers, they were drafting at times like 60,000 individuals a month. So, you know, a lot of people were processing through. I think uh, scores were maintained to a point. Mm -hmm. But I know I was able to rise through the ranks rapidly simply because of the advanced training I got with the aviation electronics. And where I was assigned, I was the only autopilot man t taking care of 15 aircraft. It's, it's so impressive. within 14 months, I was an E-5, uh, which... And that's pretty unheard of these days. Pretty much unheard of. Even in our conflict today with Afghanistan and Iraq and so forth, it's still... Uh, a time when you still have to go through the whole process and so forth. But then, if you could prove yourself and do your job, you moved up pretty quickly. And especially drafting 60,000 people, like you said, per month, you know, for you to have the ability to advance that quickly, right. 
uh, you know, the military's they're cutting people today. You know, they're not keeping nearly as many right. as many individuals. So well, again, I'll, I'll just backtrack a little bit to the math that I did in high school. I never took a final. I was always exempt. I, I did very well in math. Uh, and got that in, uh, having that ability mm -hmm. made me fortunate in the sense that of those 60,000, probably my guess would be 54,000 went into the infantry. Okay. Okay, so I was one of the f select few that was able to obtain a pretty decent uh, MOS, a job mm -hmm. within the Army. And, and, so what, and what was your MOS? 35 and 20, as they referred to it then, uh, aviation electronics, uh, flight control equipment. Okay. So were you on the front lines during the Vietnam War or were you <laughs> behind the scenes? <coughs> That's an interesting question is in Vietnam there were no lines. Okay. To be very honest with you. I mean there was the DMZ, the demilitarized zone at the 17 parallel, uh, but anything else after that was whoever controlled the area. Mm -hmm. um, where I was stationed at Marble Mountain Air Facility it was controlled by the Marines. Uh, we were an Army unit on there flying missions for the Marines primarily. Uh, and uh, so they took care of all of the safeguards, uh, the security and so forth. What we mostly had to worry about was rockets and mortars coming in. Okay. Trying to destroy obviously us and our equipment and so forth. Um, the first few months we were in Vietnam from October of 67 till mid-January of 68, there was really nothing much going on. We were getting ourselves established and so forth. And then once the Tet Offensive hit in late January of 68, uh, from that point on until I went home in October of 68, we were hit like about 180 plus times. Really? It could be two mortars one night, 15 rockets another, it, it, just to keep us on our toes and you never knew exactly what was going on. But we never had to worry about a frontal attack, mm -hmm. but we had to worry about the rockets. And, and to piggyback on the Tet Offensive that you said you were involved in, it started uh, 1968, January right. 30th. It was one of the biggest military tactical campaigns between, uh, between Vietnam and the United States and the other countries that we were fighting with. And it stretched all the way to September of 1968. And there were three phases. Phase one was January to March, phase two, May to June, and then August to September was phase three. Mm. So you were obviously involved in all three of those phases. Right. Can, you, can you tell us a little bit about the, the different phases? And Well, you know? I could primi primarily tell you about the first phase uh, because uh, what had happened there, uh, when the Tet Offensive started in January, late January of 68, virtually every provincial capital was overrun by the, either the North Vietnamese or the Viet Cong. They had initial successes. In fact, they even made it into the U.S. Embassy in Saigon. Okay. Um, Way, the ancient capital of Way, there was a fight there with the Marines for about three weeks before we could dislodge them. So they had some successes initially. Okay. What it did, Brendan, was when, it, when all of this started to be reported back home, it was like, what is going on over there? Uh, see, because Westmoreland had been talking about beginning to send troops home in Christmas of 67. Uh, so who was General Westmoreland? General Westmoreland was the commander in uh, chief of the troops in Vietnam. Uh, and uh, basically in charge regardless of, of whatever branch of the military you were in, you fell under, they fell under Westmoreland's leadership and so forth. So, yeah. uh, I see here that you sustained uh, some combat or service related injuries, uh, pos of prostate cancer, possibly from Agent Orange. Could you tell us about that? I mean, we hear a lot about Agent Orange, you know, whether it be in movies or in books, but you know, we weren't there, we can never really get a yes. sense of that. So can you tell us a little bit about it? The, the prostate cancer that um, I developed uh, was fairly recently, the past three years or so, uh, and been operated on and removed. Uh, but Agent Orange was a defoliant that they used. Obviously, Vietnam was... Uh, and a defoliant is? Uh, to kill vegetation, okay. anything, basically, anything that lives. Uh, 
And uh, so we were, you know, using it there to try to get rid of hiding places for the Viet Cong, uh, the Vietnamese, the North Vietnamese Army, and so forth. Uh, planes sprayed it. Uh, some troops on the ground actually had people who uh, carried packs on their back and sprayed it by hand. Uh, my wife graduated with a young man named Jim Roxby, uh, who, when he died in his 50s, looked like he was in his 80s. Yeah. Were, were both sides uh, in the war using Agent no, Orange, or was just it just us. the Americans? Just the Americans. And how was it created? Like, do you know who thought uh, of using this? For the the, the, uh, our chemical companies here, uh, I won't mention any names right. per se, but uh, because there's still fights going on between veterans and things of that nature with the Agent Orange uh, situation. Uh, the other thing that we used uh, extensively in Vietnam was napalm, okay. which was uh, uh, incendiary bombs that actually not only burned the vegetation, but sucked the uh, oxygen out of the air so that any living thing within, the, if it wasn't burned, uh, basically lost its life because it had no oxygen to breathe. Did so. the Americans know what the effects of Agent Orange were going to be on their troops? And if so, uh, they probably wouldn't have used it, I'm guessing? No, I, I don't think they knew the effects and they still deny it today. Okay. What, were you many, wearing gas masks when, no. when spraying this? It was no, just we, all... we, we never knew when it was being sprayed and so forth for the most part. And, you know, and then wind could carry it anywhere and you know if it was done from a plane or a helicopter and what have you. Uh, the only ones that could control it were the ones on the ground but again because they were touching it and breathing it uh, they had severe effects. What kinds of uh, friendships and camaraderie did you form while serving whether it be in the United States or over in, in Vietnam and, and what were their names and can you tell us a little bit about them? Oh God yeah there were a number of people. Doyle Duke, who lives, uh, lived up in Hartford, Connecticut. He was a great guy. He was our supply sergeant for our uh, aviation electronics. Uh, a sidekick of his from New York City was T.C. Williams. Uh, and, and here was the thing. Uh, Doyle and, and T.C. Uh, were African-American black gentlemen and so forth. And then I had, uh, you know, other good friends in our unit, uh, Kenny, uh, Kenny Westbrook and Kenny Davis, one from Chattanooga, Tennessee, and the other from Georgia. And we all just got along. Right. We, we got along simply because we were there for a, a reason. A reason. It's, it's pretty remarkable how, you know, you take these guys out of their element, out of their states, and then, you know, you all gel together, you know, right. and then you have friends across the country, yeah. you know, for uh, life. Yeah, it's... The unit I flew for, or I worked for, uh, our pilots loved us because most of our officers were pilots. And we won a number of accommodation or recommend commendation medals from both the South Vietnamese government and the United States government. Now, that didn't mean a whole lot to me, Brendan, because I was getting out when my term of duty was up. But for a career soldier, especially a career officer, as they go up for promotions, mm -hmm. all of those things in their 201 file Right. They definitely make, make a make, difference. Make a difference. So So I see today uh, there's quite a fine line in the military between enlisted ranks and officer ranks. The enlisted are supposed to, you know, stay with the enlisted, the officers amongst themselves. How was it, you know, in Vietnam and, and back in the 60s? Was it still the same or was it a you little know, bit different? I guess because of the job that I did and the units that I was assigned to, it was a little different. I'm going to assume that most of the military is that way, where there's a differentiation between enlisted men and, and officers right. and so forth. Uh, but again, because all of our officers flew, they depended on us. Exactly. You know, you Their were... lives depended on us. So if we did a good job... They were happy. They were happy. And if you, you didn't know, do a good Keeping those job, planes in the air and so forth. Right. And uh, so they really respected the job that we did. And we, you know, obviously we respected them because of their, I mean, uh, there were some of the guys in our uh, outfit that were West Point grads and things of that nature. So they were looking to, to stay with the military for a long time. And all of that stuff paid big dividends. Even when I came back to Hunter Army Airfield, uh, I was assigned to a unit that was flying the new Huey Cobras, mm -hmm. gunships. And all of those pilots flew. So again, we had a good mix back there in Savannah. So you were not married yet at the time no. when you served in Vietnam? No. Okay, you just had your, your 
three sisters, your brother and your, and your parents, right. and then other extended family. So <laughs> when you were over in Vietnam, how did you stay in touch with them? Just by letter writing. Letter writing? Did you, that was it. Did you receive letters, letters back from them? Yeah, typically. Uh, how, yeah, how, would they, how would they get there? Uh, basically, they would transport them over. Uh, that was one of the benefits, just so you know, that uh, when we were in Vietnam, we didn't have to put a stamp on our mail to send it. Okay. They went home for free. Okay, but uh, uh, that's how we communicated and so forth. In fact, I was coming home in October of 67. If I had extended two months into early December, I would have come back with less than six months left on my enlistment and I would have been discharged. So I sent a letter to my grandmother, to my father through his mother, telling him what I wanted to do and he, I basically got a letter back about two weeks later stating, come home, your mother's going crazy. Okay. Just come home. Right. I, I, and, that's what I was going to ask, yeah. you know, why did you not stay those two extra months I, and, and so, just discharge, but that makes perfect sense. Yeah, so. so while you were over in Vietnam, did you get any time, you know, to yourself? Well, yeah, we, uh, we got a, if you will, a week's leave, mm -hmm. a week's vacation, uh, what they refer to as R&R rest, <coughs> excuse me rest and recuperation. <coughs> and I spent a week in Taiwan. How was uh, that? That was nice. It was nice to get away. It was nice to get a hot shower. I can only imagine. Get some good food right. and so forth. Uh, you know, it was, it was kind of great. When we flew over, <coughs> we, we landed in Japan to refuel. And on this Air Force base in Japan, when we went into the, the latrine, yeah. the, the Army uses as a word, <clears throat> it looked terrible. It looked dingy and so forth. Coming home, we stopped at the same air, air base. No, this was on a commercial flight coming home. Went into the same place and it looked like the Taj Mahal. <laughs> I mean, Especially it was just... serving in Vietnam. Yeah, it was just the difference. So you got that, that one week of paid leave Right. right. Um, if it wasn't during wartime in Vietnam, would you have normally gotten 30 days? Leave 30 or, days, or yeah. That, so it hasn't 30 changed. days a year. It has not changed, no. Okay. So what did you do for recreation when you were off duty other, other than, you know, going to Taiwan? To be very honest with you, not a whole lot. Uh, most of our missions we flew at night or from dusk until dawn. So you were up all night uh, making sure that the, all the planes were going off okay. Uh, typically, if you could get back to your cot by about 7 in the morning before it got too hot, you could get some, uh, maybe four or five hours of good sleep in. What were the temperatures over there in Vietnam? Oh, it could range anywhere from, I don't think it ever went below 85, from like 85 to 105, but the humidity was the, the killer, the humidity. And, and let me tell you folks, when it rained, it didn't mess around over there, it rained, okay? Uh, I, we just quit wearing our ponchos because your clothes would stink more from your perspiration than if they just got wet from the rain and so forth. But uh, if we didn't, if we had to work a little bit later, like into maybe 8, 9 o'clock in the morning, to be very honest with you, I went to the enlisted man's club, had a few beers, and then went to try to lay down and fall asleep. Right. So not many people have obviously been over to Vietnam. Uh, for those who have not, can you uh, please describe the terrain? Was it uh, was it grassy? Was it more like a desert? Actually, it's uh, it's very coastal. <coughs> then it goes into the highlands. It's a very beautiful country. Uh, uh, as the sun would set behind the mountains, it almost had this bluish tint on the on the vegetation and so forth. Uh, it, again, it was a, a, a beautiful country and you asked earlier about some people that I stay in touch with. I mainly stay in touch with now the guys that I went to school with after I got out of the service. And at the last reunion we had about three years ago at Bloomsburg, a uh, good friend of mine, I played softball with him for a number of years. I just found out that he had been taking families back to Vietnam. They would find out an approximate spot where their son may have died 
and Bob was leading tours to that. Right. And at, unfortunately, at that time, when I found out about it, he said that that was probably going to be his last tour because the parents were getting too old. Right. But I mean, at least they got that closure. They saw where their <coughs> right. son or daughter was right. killed, you mm -hmm. know, in Vietnam. So, uh, where were you when the war ended? Obviously, you said you left in October of 1968. It ended what? Uh, I want to say six to eight, six to eight years later. Uh, in, in 75, it ended. 75. So seven years later. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> at that time, I had finished. I, I had gone to school after uh, Vietnam. Went to Bloomsburg. Graduated there in in seventy three, and then I was working there under a federal grant, helping other veterans use their educational benefits. Mm -hmm. And uh, back, back then, was it the Montgomery GI Bill? Uh, today, it's the post. It, no, we uh, w what you guys have today is a GI Bill, right? It, it, and they, and you earn it, mm -hmm. you deserve right. it. What we got back then was one hundred thirty five dollars a month, and out of that, you paid for everything. Okay, but anyway. Uh, there was a lot of good guys on campus. Uh, we've started a veterans club and things of that nature, and so we get together about every two or three years, uh, reminisce, have a few drinks, right. and so forth. How did you return home? How did I return home? I returned home by plane. Mm -hmm. uh, flew into Fort Lewis, no, McCord Air Force Base in Washington. Got a new set of uniforms and a steak dinner in Fort Lewis, and. Since I live in Northeast PA, I, have an, I had uncles living in Philadelphia and one owned a bar down there and I called them and I said, Uncle John, I'm home, but I'm landing in Philadelphia like around eight o'clock and there's no planes up to Wilkes-Barre Scranton till the next morning, can you pick me up? And I flew into, when I was going down the escalator and I saw him at the bottom, that's when I started crying. I knew I was home. Okay, and he picked me up. We went to his bar. We sat there for a few hours, and then he just drove me home. He said, "You don't want to stay here tonight," so he, he drove me up, as to, he to referred Nanticoke? to it, to Nanny Cook, yeah, upstate, as right. they refer to it. To your to your friends and family, yeah. obviously. Yeah. And I'm sure that was the greatest feeling in the world. Oh, it was. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, you definitely hear mixed reviews about Vietnam veterans when they come home, how they're received by the community and their friends and family. How were you received by the community and your and your family? Being from a small community, I think I was well received. I mm -hmm. think, uh, you know, I didn't have any animosity toward me. Uh, I can't recall any at the airports and things of that nature. But I'll qualify that because when I came home in October of 68, although Ted had hit, happened and the protests were beginning, beginning to mount, it was still, if you will, quote, a popular war. So, it was later on, 69, 70, and so forth, when the protests really started going, right. uh, got great guns in this country, that the veterans started. And what's odd about it, uh, Brendan, is that at the, uh, near the end of the Vietnam War, the only people that were act actually actively protesting the war were the Vietnam veterans against the war. Really? Really. Uh, that's definitely not heard of that often. Yeah, because... See, Congress, they do things once in a while, and they, 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 <laughs> they created the lottery. And which was what? Basically, your birthday gave you, each year they would draw a number, 365 numbers, and if, okay, if they drew April 17th, that's number one. March 22nd would be number two. Mm -hmm. and, and what did this lottery do? Okay, if you had a number between one and 183, you were draftable. Okay. 184 to a 365, you didn't have to worry. So they cut the protest right in half. People weren't protesting the war. Not, I, I'll qualify that. Not all of them. But most of them were protesting the fact that they didn't want to go. And I don't blame them, in a sense. I think uh, for many reasons after the fact. But the key, the key was that they stopped that in, uh, I don't know if you ever saw the movie uh, Born on the Fourth of July. I have not. Okay. Uh, it's, uh, I can't even think of his name right now. Uh, anyway, very famous actor is in it and he loses his uh, leg, or not his leg, the use of his legs and mm -hmm. so forth. And uh, He was all gung-ho to go to Vietnam and toward the end of the movie now he is being 
thrown out of the Republican uh, National Convention by Nixon because he's trying to protest the war. Okay, uh, and it, it's based on a true story. But the key is that, uh, you know, my grandfather served, my father served, and I'd have students ask me in class, well, did you ever think of going to Canada or, you know, avoiding the draft? And, and that never entered my mind because I felt, okay, I have an obligation. And it was my turn to serve, right. okay? And so, you know, whether I was drafted or enlisted or what have you, I was going to do my thing and... Uh, right, then again. and you're part of the 1%. You know, there's over 320 million Americans today. Only 1%, you know, serve. So, yeah. you know, you're very special in that aspect. Yeah. So going back to the lottery, obviously the war ended in 1975. Mm -hmm. uh, when did Congress implement this lottery? And was it more or less to just uh, diffuse uh, the protesters and, and what they were against in the war? I'm trying to think, right? It would have been like maybe 1970. Okay. Right around, uh, I'm not sure if it was before the Kent State incident or... The shootings? The shootings at okay. Kent State or, or after, but right in that time frame, somewhere in there mm -hmm. um, is when they instituted it. Um, you know, it, it was just like the original draft. I mean, there were so many different classifications and so forth. I mean, you know, one was uh, uh, because of religious objection. I mean, I don't know of a religion on this world who teaches you to kill. Exactly. So shouldn't everybody be disqualified on that ground and right. so forth, you know? So they got rid of those classifications and brought in the lottery and uh, and then, uh, well, now I think you still need to register for the selective service, but there is no draft. Correct. So. Uh, so a lot of, uh, of civilians, you know, they get into their regimen, you know, whether they do three or four years, or they do over 20 years, and then they have to transition back into civilian life. And a lot of them have a lot of issues. You know, today, the Veterans Affairs offices are very good in trying to help the veterans. You know, there's definitely a lot more that could be done. But uh, back in those days, you know, how you know, easy or difficult was it transitioning from, you know, doing your three years in, experiencing all that you did in Vietnam, and then transitioning back to civilian life? Uh, basically, there was nothing available for us. Nothing. Uh, you know, I, I think I was fortunate in the sense that shortly after I got out, I went to school, and I met up with other guys, and we basically talked among ourselves, and you know, became friends and acquaintances. You know, I'm, I'm godfather for some children of friends, you know, that I met during this time frame while we were in school together. Uh, but uh, there, was, there was nothing really available uh, that, you know, a Vietnam veteran could go look to and so forth. And again, don't forget, there was that stigma attached to the Vietnam veteran. Uh, obviously, we talked about uh, the friends that you made while in Vietnam or around the United States, and you said that the, most of the people that you have stayed in contact with were, you know, from, from school and everything right. like that. Um, have you remained in contact with or reunited with other fellow veterans, you know, from Vietnam or from your school? Not really, no. Well, from this, when I went to school, that's all. Just, uh, just Bloomsburg? Correct. Just Bloomsburg, yeah. Okay. Uh, you know, would you would you want to reconnect with any of? Them oh, I'd love if, to if see. If you had yeah, the chance, I, yeah. If I had a chance, I'd love to. I, I've been a lifelong member of the American Legion, and each year, each month, in the back of the, they always have like uh, reunion, uh, the outfits that are having reunions mm -hmm. and so forth. And I always look for our designation, hoping some day, sometime, one of those will show up in there. Right. So you don't know where any of your fellow? No, not really. You know. No, because we we all kind of dispersed. We all went back at different times and right. so forth. And So you went to Bloomsburg, you got your degree, and what was your degree in again? Uh, my f bachelor's degree is in uh, secondary ed, social sciences, and my master's is in Far Eastern history. And uh, what have you done uh, other than that since separating from the military? How well, do you put that to use? Two years, uh, for two years after I graduated with my undergraduate at Bloom, I worked under a federal grant helping other veterans uh, utilize their educational benefits and so forth. Uh, and then a friend of mine who had been in the financial aid office went to Lackawanna College and called me a few months later and said, how would you like an admissions job? Okay, what's admissions? So, you know, pretty much what you're doing now. So I went up to Lackawanna, worked there for a number of years. Uh, from there, I went to Wilkes University uh, and ended up being the director of admissions for a number of years there. Then I entered the Penn State system, 
Um, and I worked the last 15 years for Penn State. And can you tell us about your experiences here at Penn State? Was it just at Penn State Lehigh Valley? Was it at Penn State Berks, main campus? Uh, all at Lehigh Valley. Okay. And uh, I, I enjoyed admissions work. Uh, and very quickly, I'll tell you why I enjoyed it. When I started, when I was applying to schools, I went down for an open house in Bloomsburg, and they're talking about all of these you know, the high school credit grades that you needed and the SAT scores, and I'm thinking, okay, I might as well go home, <laughs> okay? But anyway, I left there, I left the, the auditorium and I went to the admissions office and I was able to meet this gentleman named Burl Gum. I will never forget Mr. Gum as long as I live. And we chatted and I said, I applied and so forth. I said, listen, I was not a star in high school. I never planned on going to college and here's my situation. And a couple of days before Christmas, uh, in 69, I got my acceptance letter. So I started January of 70. And after my first week on campus, I decided, okay, I'll go thank him, mm -hmm. you know. And he happened to be in the office and I walked in and, and we sat down and he said, you know, he said, uh, once upon a time, an admissions officer took a chance on a Korean War vet with a GED. And that was him. Really? So he served, that war was he from served 1950 in Korea. to 1954, I believe? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So he served in Korea, went out. He ended up with a PhD in accounting, okay? And I always remembered that. So when I would sit down with a student and their families and so forth, yes, I would talk about Wilkes. Yes, I would talk about Penn State, wherever I was working and so forth. But I always try to listen to the students so I could give them the best advice on what they should be doing or searching for right. for their education. Yeah, and I'm really glad that that he gave you that chance. Obviously, yeah. uh, I just actually did an interview with Terry DeCamp. He okay. was a retired first sergeant in the Army. He uh, served for 24 years, so he did uh, Operation Desert Storm and a bunch of other things. And he said, and he's very correct, the military itself is a very social, uh, like a unique social group into itself. You know, we, we have very different outlooks than people who have not served. And we should all definitely be given a chance, you know, yeah. when we get out to go to college and to excel in different things. So I think, personally, I think the citizens of the United States are missing out by not experiencing me. You don't have to like everybody that you serve with. Right, and th that goes but, to the civilian sector as well. But you have to learn how to work with everyone. Exactly. And that's so important that I don't care what creed, what color, what nation, nationality, what have you, okay? Everyone has something to contribute and you just need to know how to work with those folks. Exactly. And, and I, I think that was the biggest thing I ever took out of the military. So. so how did your wartime experiences affect your life? I probably became a, if you will, a peacenik, for Which lack is, of a better term. I would like to see us live in peace and harmony throughout the world. Uh, war accomplishes nothing, it, it, you know, in, in my opinion. And, uh, you know, as a commentary, I just want to add this, that the sad part about Vietnam, did we win, lose? I think the veterans that served won because we did our job. Did we lose the war? Yes. But I think the biggest, the biggest thing with Vietnam was that we learned nothing from it. None of our politicians learned a thing, not our military. We still send young people off to die. I used to tell my class when I would teach it here, I say, you know, when you look at a, a Vietnam veteran, you're looking at an old man standing in front of you. You taught a class here yeah, at, at yeah. Penn State Lehigh Valley. Yes. How, how many years did you do that for? About 10. Is there still a class offered here? Yeah, uh, Dave, Dave Longenbach teaches it now. Okay. And I usually come in as a guest commentator once in a while for him. But uh, I used to tell the class, I said, you know, you look at me, I'm a Vietnam veteran, and I'm an old man. I said, but you have to understand, I was your age when they drafted me. I said, it's old men like me that send young people like you to die. It's pretty deep. I mean, but that's the reality of it. Mm -hmm. uh, what are some life lessons that you learned from the service other than, you know, teamwork and, and the structure that you had? Oh, I think just how to learn to live with people and accept people and so forth. Uh, you know, to me, a person is a person. 
I don't care one way or the other. Uh, you know, uh, I had friends uh, from all walks of life and so forth, and I just, uh, you know, I, I just accept people for who they are. And, right. uh, and I think that was a great lesson that I learned in the military mm -hmm. that I would have never learned at home. When I was in the, uh, the most people that I ever stayed with at one point uh, was in boot camp. It was my division and another division. It was 40 and 40, so there were 80 guys living in one space. And, you know, some nights, you know, were better than others. We would argue and, and other things like that. What was the biggest amount of people that you ever, st you know, stayed with at one point? Uh, probably basic training. Uh, mm -hmm. If I recall correctly, there were 60 guys in a barracks, 30 on each floor, mm -hmm. excuse me. And then the shower, there were, now there were four, four barracks in each company. So that's what, 60 times four, 240 guys trying to use seven, sh six shower heads mm -hmm. when you were done for the day. So, I mean, you get rid of all of your inhibitions real quick, you know, and all of, you know, all of your uh, taboos and so forth, mm -hmm. you really, you really have to adapt. I mean, it's it's a whole it's a whole different scenario. Exactly. Uh, how has your military service impacted your feelings about war and the military in general? You've touched on it a, a couple times, yeah. but I just uh, you know again, uh, I think I think maybe I'm completely wrong, but I think if if the people people like ourselves in this room could meet the people of Iran and could meet the people of Afghanistan and the people of Russia, we could get along. And why do you think that? Well, I, I, I think because the people would work together. I think the people would understand each other more so than our political leaders and ideologies that don't even exist. I mean, we call ourselves a democracy, which we're not, mm -hmm. okay? They refer to Russia as a communist state, which according to Marx, communism has never existed on the face of this earth, okay? I mean, we just keep throwing out these terms that you could label people mm -hmm. so quickly that, you know, he's this or she's that, and all of a sudden they have a stigma attached to mm -hmm. them. But if the people, you know, I mean, if the coal miners of Northeast Pennsylvania and the, the farmers of the Midwest and everything got together with the coal miners of Poland and, and, and Russia and, and the farmers, and what do we have to fight about? Right. We're not gaining anything mm -hmm. except a livelihood. Uh, is there anything you feel like we haven't discussed or, or should be added to this interview? I, I just would like to reiterate that I, you know, uh, again, talking about my experience in Vietnam and being a Vietnam veteran, I think uh, I, I would like someday that somebody would say, you know, we've learned what we did wrong there and those people didn't die in vain. And unfortunately, that won't happen in my lifetime, I don't think. Uh, I, mean, I, I wish it would, but I don't think it will. I, I couldn't agree more. I, I hope that it happens you know, during, during my lifetime. I'm 24 years old, so we'll just have to wait and see yeah. uh, what happens. Yeah. Oh. Th th Thank you very much.